have four different speakers from different countries around the world that will be here today, uh, either to change, to exchange expertise, to connect with us, share knowledge, and also make sure that we are moving forward in our understanding of what public employment services can do in order to promote fair recruitment. So my name is Charles Crevier. I am the manager of the Social Protection, Governance, and Tripartism program here at the International Training Center of the ILO. I'm delighted to be here uh, because since last year, the ILO, together with the International Training Center of the ILO, is proposing online event open to the public on different topics related to fair recruitment. This webinar is part of the ILO Fair Recruitment Initiative Knowledge Exchange Series. Today, together with our guest speakers, international experts and also national practitioners, we will reflect on the role of public employment services and how can we actually play a better and more effective role in fair recruitment promotion. Uh, we will hear from them a uh, very practical experience and I'm sure that they will spark inspiration, they will give you new ideas, and they will enrich your knowledge. So we are excited that you're connecting today, and we are delighted to, uh, to be here also with ILO colleagues. Along with us, we have our ILO colleagues, Anna Karim Pam Olson. She is the technical specialist at the Labor Market Services located at the headquarter of the ILO. She holds a master's degree in international le legal science, and she did specialize in European Union law and human rights. She comes from international affairs, uh, from the Swedish public employment services, where she worked for 17 years. She was mostly involved with planning, follow-up, development of all operations as a project manager and she was also responsible for the international aspect, aspect of Agenda 2030. She has worked with the free movement of workers within the EU and the mobility of workers globally. She believes that employment is the strongest factor in order to reduce poverty and that it is extremely important for all of us to make sure that we could actually move freely across borders. She will be here with us to give us some uh, opening remark on behalf of the island. So, Anna Karim, I'm delighted to give you the floor. Thank you for being with us. Thank you very much, Charles, and thank you for that lovely introduction. They're all, thank you for coming, for showing your interest for this subject. As Charles said, my name is Anna Karim Parmolson, and I work as a technical specialist at the ILO on labor market services. The world of work has changed forever. And if we know one thing, it is that COVID-19 was not the latest global crisis we've ever seen. Professions are evolving, changing, and disappearing while other sectors are on the rise. This is all driven on by the four megatrends, uh, globalization, digitalization, demographic shifts, and climate change. The multiplication of crises in combination with increasing inequalities between and within countries risk hampering economic and labor market developments more than ever before. Lessons learned are that labor market must increase their resilience and functionality to kind of uh, to to ensure that we sorry to ensure that we have a good way of facing our future. The world of work is changing rapidly and policy responses need to adapt accordingly to provide sustainable support and protection. Uh, sustainable, sustainable Development Goal 8 is the common denominator globally when promoting job creation and support to the development of enterprises, as well as in trying to achieve full employment while protecting decent work conditions. According to, SD, to the SDG Compass, one example of key actions to achieve SDG 8 is to install a firm policy against unfair hiring and recruitment practices, particularly of vulnerable groups, groups such as migrant workers. A major challenge on the labor markets today is one is the one of mismatch, including the need to transition from the informal to the formal economy. Employment services are at the core of labor market policies 
and are cost-effective interventions. Employment services, public and private, are providing intermediation services aiming to make labor market transitions more transparent and job matches more efficient. Such services are set to improve the speed and the quality of the match between available jobs and job seekers. Employment services therefore contribute to a wider economic and social agenda by improving productivity and job satisfaction through better skills mismatches, or sorry, better skills matches, that is, and by helping the unemployed increase their income, reduce social and family reliance, and reduce impacts of unemployment or underemployment. For the employer, effective and efficient intermediation services reduce output losses, increases productivity, and reduces staff time in human resources management. To apply sufficiently flexible responses, public employment services are becoming increasingly dependent upon effective coordination with partners. Successful cooperation between partners depend upon capacity to anticipate and ideally influence labor market changes. Enhanced systems for coordination of labor market information are becoming increasingly important to enable transparency and active rather than reactive responses. Interaction between different actors in the labor market relies on trust, which can only be achieved when there are equal and accurate regulations. It is therefore core that the regulatory system for private employment agencies is expanded and advanced to ensure fair facilitation of the labor market and fair recruitments. Within the ILO community, member states have already agreed upon international labor standards and for public employment services, that is Convention 88. And for private recruitment agencies, that is Convention 181. The ILO is here to support countries and constituents to ratify and implement these standards. Do not hesitate to reach out to me or one of my colleagues should you want more information. Job seekers might not have enough resources or contacts to find the right match for their skills, or the labor market does not provide enough information about vacancies. Employers, on the other hand, might struggle with obtaining enough profile of, profiles of candidates matching their skills needs. This existing labor market inefficiency, if you will, uh, creates a demand for intermediaries who can provide an overview of available skills and jobs as well as have the coordination capacity for the actual matching between skills demand and skills to apply. The inefficiency becomes even more apparent when dealing with international recruitments. To enhance the sustainability agenda, it is important to ensure resilient intermediation and facilitation of the labor markets to make sure that the next crisis that come uh, the labor markets can have policy responses to mitigate the impacts and ensure that the world of work and labor markets can continue to develop according to their potentials. I look forward to the fruitful discussions and to all the insights we jointly will achieve during this webinar. Thank you very much for this opportunity to speak to you and over to you, Charles. Merci beaucoup, Anna Karim. C'est un plaisir de vous avoir avec nous. Comme vous le savez, cette Conference. Good to have you with us, and it is a pleasure with us. As you know, this conference will take place in it, in English, French, and Spanish. So, let me speak in French uh, now. We have uh, four analysts, high level analysts, coming from different countries in the world, and the first um, uh, person I would like to uh, introduce you is a Naima from Morocco, Naima Barui from Anabek. Uh, so thank you uh, for being here with us. So you are the person responsible for service division uh, within the Anapep that was established in the year 2000 and has the mission to contribute to the organization and the deployment of uh, trainings and curricula and she is in charge of the matching uh, between demand and supply, but also information and also the uh, all assistance to these applicants, job applicants. She also works 
in collaboration with employers in order for, to help them uh, and better understand their needs in terms of skills and uh, in order also to have a better matching between uh, all the different actors. Uh, so it's a sheer pleasure to have you with us. Thank you. Moving from French uh, and moving from Morocco all the way to Sudan, Sweden. I'm delighted to present John Scratch from the European Employment Service Network. Mr. John, uh, you are the national coordinator in, in Sweden of the URES network. Launched in 1994, URES is the European Cooperation Network of Employment Services, which is designed to facilitate the free movement of workers. With nearly 20 years experience in public administration, you have covered several areas really relating to cooperation, between labor market sectors. In your country, you have facilitated the introduction of private providers as part of the public employment services. You have worked at the World Association of Public Employment Services and at the European Commission, where you have worked with the network of public employment services and on the reform of your institutions. As an active assessor of the public employment services network, uh, you were able also to bench learning activities and also evaluate and provide recommendation to several of the public employment service in the European Union. So John, it's an honor to have you with us. You come here with a lot of expertise, a lot of good practices. So we'll be hearing for you in a few minutes. Maintenant de, le, de la Suède à la Tunisie, j'ai le plaisir de présenter Madame Kensha Garbi de l'Agence Tunisienne de Coopération Technique. From Sweden to Tunisia, now I have the pleasure to introduce you to Ms. Kanta Garbi from Tunisia. She's in charge of uh, Head of Marketing and Communication in uh, Research and Marketing, and she's also the focal point for migration-related projects. As a reminder, the Tunisian Agency for Technical Cooperation, ATCT, is a public, non-profit making organization set up in 1972 to participate in the development and implementation of state policy in the field of technical cooperation by mobilizing its know-how and its human and institutional skills in the service of international solidarity and development. It also carries out development and cooperation programs within the framework of bilateral or triangular cooperation in partnership with donors such as the IDB, DBAD, DBADEA, all acronyms, and of course, with the International Training Center of the ILO, an important uh, uh, actor. So, Ms. Garby, it's a true pleasure to have you here for your intervention that will be delivered a little bit later on. And also different countries. We're going to move from Tunisia all the way to Germany. So I'm delighted to introduce our next speaker. Uh, she will be also our final panelist today. Her name is Nicole Klob, and she is from the World Association of Public Employment Services. Please be welcome. She works at the World Association of Public Employment Services, which is the worldwide platform for the exchange of information, knowledge between public employment services. Our organization is a global partner in the field of employment and labor market issue. She has been seconded to our organization in Brussels by the German Federal Public Employment Agency. Nicole has been working with the Public Employment Service since 2016 where she was advising different groups of customer and led a team of like pl placement officer before moving to Belgium to work within the EU representation of the German Federal Employment Agency. So all of them together will be part of our panelists. Uh, they have been prepared. I mean, we have allocated two questions per panelist. They will be uh, expected to give us around 10 minutes answer uh, to those two questions. To get started, I uh, would like to start with our very first panelist that I have already introduced from Morocco. 
And I will also take advantage to move from English to French so that we could hear a bit more from Madame Barry. Donc, Madame Barry, comme vous le savez, vous êtes notre première panéliste aujourd'hui. Donc, c'est un grand plaisir d'échanger avec vous. Encore une fois, soyez la bienvenue. Donc, on It's va a true pleasure to have you here. So, we're going to be uh, interested in the activity of the ANAPAC, which is the National Agency for the Promotion of Employment and Skills in Morocco. So, in your opinion, what strategy did the ANAPAC develop in favor of the most vulnerable populations, and in particular for the integration of uh, uh, migrant workers in the uh, labor market of Morocco? You have the floor, Ms. Naima. Thank you. Thank you very much, dear friends of the ITCILO, for this initiative that we are particularly interested in. We need to know also other experiences and projects concerning these projects involving stakeholders and policies and families of the youth and vulnerable people, people who do not often turn to institutions but they are outside our radars and that tend to uh, be unheard. So these people are considered as invisible. Maybe these people cannot be seen and that is why it is necessary to, to have a specific uh, strategy developed to address them. So we're going to, we, we started working to get to know who this population is. We worked on pilot experiences and we tried to work with partners working on these different problems. I will provide you with examples of innovative projects on which we have worked. These uh, experiences started with the ILO for the opening of our services for young people who obtain a diploma and then with migrants. And the vulnerable population, that is people having a complex profile and also single mothers, people in the rural environments of the disabled and other fragile categories. So what responses would you try to address this population? Certainly the idea of offering services, as usual, is not a solution because we had to change paradigm and look for innovative solutions for our local environment involving the local stakeholders. And it's been necessary to work on a change and and of course, we cannot support a population that we do not know with services already developed for other types of targets. And so it was necessary to get to know the population. We cannot support them within our agencies. So it was necessary to get out of that and work and go work in the field and go and try to create a network for this population getting to know the territory better, their actors, getting to know the uh, the local territory, try to cooperate with other stakeholders. And each one was working in their small yard, but this does not work. It is necessary to find complementarity, to build bridges and go to accessibility and proximity for services. What is also important, we noticed that it was necessary to work on formalization. It is necessary to formalize experiences so as to create continuity and to work with exchanges as we're doing now, working on individual problems. There is no magic wand, there is no single uh, solution, but we need to create tailor-made solutions. There has been a negative uh, interpretation of migration, but now we can consider that as a positive sign. 
it's important for migrants to be supported, to be more visible and to be approached of institutions and services. And certainly work on enhancement of profiles. We're talking about young people who find it hard to have their competencies and skills recognized and say it's important to work on that because we still haven't solved this problem. It is still there, but we are working on that. And then I will conclude with the fact that it is necessary to take into account new jobs. So we're no longer talking about classical, traditional um, um, forms of employment, but we're talking about coach for employment. So people who uh, are not going to work in the normal uh, modes, and it's not through traditional networks, but it's more about approaching these people also sports activity, cultural activities, that is where we can approach this population. I'm going to try and present some experiences that we have developed with the support of the ILO. We have started targeting young people having obtained a diploma and working on an offer that can attract these people. So we started working with migrants. You know that Morocco has been a land of transition, but it has become a place where migrants get installed. And that is why we needed to develop a, a national strategy for migration. We did an extraordinary work with the government and the ILO. And we worked on the community measures for migrants, opening in the information system for migrants and mobile applications. We also worked on the fact that a migrant, when they come and see an agency, If they see an image where they, by they can identify, they are more willing to turn to the services of the agencies. Now we're working on the balance of skills together with the ILO, especially for those who do not hold the diploma, who do not have a, a job profile and find it hard to have skills recognized. We've also been working on the GZ in the rural environment. We cannot support people without taking into account the stakeholders in a certain territory. That is why it is necessary to carry out a diagnosis of the territory. The involving community agencies and uh, stepping towards people, reaching out mobilize people and approach people. This experience has been extraordinary. As I was saying, it is not the through administrative work that we can solve the problem. So when we launched for the acquisition of the platform, we noticed that most people joining at quite a low level of education. These people have a problem of understanding and communication and the fact of working in a digital way with them to approach them is uh, certainly a positive experience. We've also worked uh, on the network, uh, working on the psychological aspect for this population. With Cisco, we also worked on formalization. So continuity, and we worked 
on formalization because it is through international cooperation that we can obtain financing and working on formalization means seeking funding, reaching out to two territories and people living there. What has been interesting with this mechanism has been that it is based on individual approaches. Mobilization is extremely important through community actions, actions carried out by the young people We try to encourage, uh, to facilitate actions for the young people, encouraging them to, to go forward, creating the social links and the network also among the young people themselves, and then getting out with individual plans. I know it's a lot. We're quite aware about that. But today, thanks to the international cooperation, we are looking for new solutions. Reaching out also for enterprises. And ensuring the involvement of enterprises who wish to set up these systems. So the aim is really to get out of isolation, work with civil society, using all the digital tools and adapt through communication. Because we've been able to reach in important figures and we would not have, we wouldn't have been able to do that without these network and using the networks people using it. It is really thanks to these connections and these tools used by the young people that we can reach out to them. And then we are working on the adaptation of services. It's been a truly positive experience. Thanks to that, we have obtained a first vocational experience of young people. Thanks to the intervention of international agencies, this enables the people to become confident again in their own possibilities. So this enable them to be part of ANAPEC and social security. So these are the new projects that we have launched at the national level involving different stakeholders. So I won't take longer because there are, I know there are many things to be said and it will be very time consuming to analyze each uh, experience. But it is very important to take into account these factors and involve the people working at the regional direction to try and formalize and develop a, a new economic model, involve donors and work on centralization. So we cannot work without communication tools. So it's through civil society that we can reach out to these young people. For example, social and psychological services and securization. And this can be obtained through the, the world of technology. Thanks to these platforms and the partners, we have been able to work on digital accessibility. We're carrying out tests on that. 
thanks to this effort, we can move forward and go beyond that. And certainly, these will break barriers and will enable us to go forward. I hope it didn't take too long. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for giving us this perspective. Very interesting uh, what you said. I have a second question for you uh, very shortly. You have two minutes to answer on a, an issue you mentioned. At the ANAPEP level, uh, how did you promote the principles of fair recruitment in your uh, programs and initiatives? Can you use these two minutes about this uh, global approach on fair recruitment and how you adapted and promoted the principles? Well, you cannot be fair uh, if you don't think at the right target uh, population. So we adopted a certain number of acts and instruments on human trafficking on the right of uh, giving, so the right of access to certain uh, professions and certain um, jobs to uh, non-Moroccans, for instance, and other uh, legal texts that have been adopted and that uh, are in line with the principles of our recruitment. So we want to give emphasis more and more on these principles. What we did and we've been doing up to now is uh, already something, but we have to work also at the private sector level, so not only the institutional level, and then we have to move to the other actors. So we have private sectors, we have invisible uh, people, and we have to make these invisible people visible. And the private sector must be sensitized and must be, we have to raise uh, the awareness uh, also in the framework of uh, private sector, but uh, these principles must be integrated at all levels, at the institutions level, at the associations level, in the different spheres of uh, the state. So raise, raising awareness uh, will be uh, key and promotion of these principles uh, will be uh, key among people and in the private sector and at the at the other uh, levels too. We could also mention the importance of not only of awareness raising through uh, traditional uh, instruments and tools, we can also use uh, modern technology just like webinars, the webinars we are organizing and, and attending today uh, to reach the same goals. Thank you, uh, Ma'am Barry. Thank you for your wisdom and for sharing very practical experiences. And thank you for uh, sharing with us your expertise and experiences in Morocco. And now to the participants, if you have a specific questions, please use the chat box and raise your questions. You have this function. And at the end of our webinar, we will just pick some questions. So. Uh, we won't give you the floor uh, directly, but you can share your questions. If you have some questions for Ma'am, Madam, uh, Madame Barry, you can use the chat box and, and just uh, write them down. And we will go back to your questions at the end of the session. Service Network. Uh, John, as I said while introducing you, your institution was launched in 1994. It is a European Corporation Network of Employment Services, which is designed to facilitate the free movement of workers. The network has always worked hard to ensure the European, that European citizen can benefit from the same opportunities. Despite language barrier, despite cultural differences, despite the uh, bureaucratic challenges, and it's quite a diverse employment law across the different European countries and a lack of recognition of educational, educational services and certificates across Europe. But you can tell us more about how those challenges were addressed 
through the creation of the European Employment Services Network. So, John, over to you. Thank you, Charles, um, and thank you for the invitation uh, to the ILO. Um, I think it's probably prudent to to touch upon the, the circumstances in which the Euros network operates. Uh, so, the European Union. Uh, and free movement of workers have been a right since the Treaty of Rome in 1958, and later it was expanded on with additional legislation. Uh, and citizens from any of the EU member states are also EU citizens these days, and they should be treated the same way as the citizens in the member state where they are in. And, uh, and the ones that are the, the regulation of free movement of workers and the Euros regulation, they are automatically applicable in all the member states, which, which means that for the Euros network, we share a common rule set uh, and that is a great benefit in setting up a functioning cooperation. Uh, we have a, a common document that we have to abide to, and it's the same for all of us. So we can, under the, that umbrella uh, of a common uh, set of rules, uh, we know where the um, expectations and boundaries of our cooperation is. And then we can expand on that uh, based on uh, the needs of the workers and the employers. Um, but I think we should not underestimate the, the, the advantages we have in, in working on free movement uh, and uh, fair mobility uh, due to this uh, the legal framework. And uh, as you said, uh, the purpose of Euros is to provide citizens uh, with support to use the free movement of workers. And uh, in this right rests the right to equal treatment to the citizens of the country where they reside. However, <laughs> Having a right does not mean that you have the practical opportunities in using this right. And uh, we know that there are several obstacles to exercising this right. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, a few in, the, in your question. And it is out of the four freedoms that we have in the EU, it's the one that is most difficult to use. Um, freedom of uh, capital, of uh, goods and of services is, is easier to use for us. Um, and we, when you look at the, the citizens of Europe and, and, and their intentions to go to another country, but also what obstacles they find, uh, the number one is, uh, is language skills. Um, but there are other issues as well. Um, the change in location in itself can be problematic. Uh, you're moving further from your family, your friends, and the familiarity of the social and cultural functioning of, of the society where you, you live. Uh, when you arrive in the new place, uh, then you have to finding a house too, could be a difficult one, and also getting accustomed to, to where you live. And some of this we can help with, some of this we cannot. Uh, Missing your family is probably out of the scope of what we do, um, but we can provide different things uh, that helps lowering the obstacles to uh, making the movement. And in in, in Europe, we, the, the foundation is free movement, but we also talk about uh, fair mobility and voluntary mobility. Uh, and and because fair mobility is a right it also means that you have the right to stay. So we are only looking to help people that want to move. Uh, we want to encourage people that are thinking about moving to get better informed on what they can expect, their opportunities, etc. cetera. But, but the voluntary part is important. And the fair part, that it has to do with what we're talking about here. It's about respecting the rules relating to work and that you have a just remuneration, you get equal treatment. And it is important for us in the network to ensure that those that we help, they're understanding these fund the foundations of this network. That if you want help from us, you know that we stand for the rights of the uh, citizens, of the workers, uh, that is important both for the workers to know, and it's important that the, the employers that we help also understand that these are the principles. If you want help from us, 
you need to uh, commit to, to following the, the rules that they are. Another part is, is sustainable work. Uh, and this links. Um, donc, so what we'll do now, we'll go to the next speaker. Hopefully, John will be able to, to find oui, some uh, of the technical oui. issues. Donc, j'aimerais dès maintenant peut-être uh, m'adresser à notre uh, panéliste. So, I'd like to give the floor now to Ma'am Kancha Garbi from Tunisia. She comes from the Technical Cooperation uh, Agency in Tunisia. She's panelist number three. Uh, thank you for being uh, with us. I hope you have a better uh, connection uh, than, than John's, unluckily. And uh, thank you once again for being here with us. It's a, a real pleasure uh, to have the chance to give you the floor and uh, try to learn something more about your agency, your organization, what you do. What so my question is, what is the approach that you have uh, developed in terms of prospects and uh, partnerships with public and private uh, partners? So, ma'am, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much and uh, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for being here uh, in, in this webinar. As you said, you, you've already presented and introduced me and, and ATCT, our agency. We have more than 50 years of experience at the international level, and we are among the first uh, public organizations in uh, Tunisia uh, that was uh, certified ISO 9001 in 2001. So we are working at the uh, 2015 uh, standard certification. We have uh, 90 uh, collaborators uh, with offices abroad in uh, Tunisia and ambas embassies in all over the world, actually more in the Gulf countries. We have some missions. So the placement and selection of Tunisian skills abroad, promotion of South-South cooperation in the framework of technical cooperation for developing countries, uh, bilateral cooperation and triangular cooperation and follow up uh, for our Tunisian uh, that are and have been recruited abroad. In our 15, 50 years of experience, we have um, placed more than 65,000 Tunisians abroad and we are following up more than uh, 15,000 uh, people. About our approach in terms of uh, prospects and partnership with employers, public and private employers, we can say that starting from the 80s, we decided to have this representative uh, bureau and office uh, in the embassies, as I told you. So in every uh, office, you have a, a councillor, a corporation councillor, who is responsible um, for uh, communication and uh, prospects and promotion of Tunisian uh, skills, follow up, or the uh, defense of moral and economic interests of uh, Tunisian uh, citizens abroad. Uh, ATCT also organizes some days, so information days where we promote our skills and we have uh, uh, several other initiatives we uh, participate to mixed committees organized by our uh, ministry of foreign affairs we organize study visits for uh, some in collaboration with some employers in order to better understand the needs in terms of skills in Tunisia and talking about partnerships, what we can say is that Tunisia has signed several agreements with many countries and based on these agreements, we try to uh, conclude some uh, uh, agreements, some partnerships in the framework of these agreements in order to place Tunisian skills in the public sector, but also in the private sector, especially uh, recruitment agencies and universities abroad. We try to evolve and to adapt to the different changes and transformations. So we gathered very good results in terms of recruitment of Tunisian uh, skills uh, in the world in several uh, sectors. In 2022, we uh, placed 3,500 Tunisians um, in, in different sectors. 
Gulf countries were the main destination of uh, technical cooperation for Tunisians, uh, 70%. Um, well, this has changed. We had a radical change in uh, the market and we started to see uh, France, Canada and other countries who are on top of the list. And so 38% now for Arab countries and 37% for European countries now. First country, receiving country is Canada, so Northern uh, America. And starting on uh, the Canadian experience, uh, we managed to analyze uh, the changes in our uh, partnerships. Started in 2018, we signed an agreement uh, between the De Economic Development Association and ATCT in Tunisia, first one from Canada and our agency. And this agreement was about uh, some uh, selection of Tunisian skills for Quebec province in Canada. And we had some uh, specialized and uh, skilled uh, workers uh, selected and recruited at first. Now we also recruit uh, teachers, nurses, uh, health uh, professionals, uh, hotel, hotel uh, professionals. Talking about missions, we had individual recruitment missions and now we have joined uh, recruitment missions with several, uh, with cl collaboration with several employers and several intermediaries. And so they work with us uh, at the ATCT. So we have also a very good collaboration between uh, Canadian government and us, but we also have all these other actors, employers and uh, Quebecois and so uh, companies. Talking about the promotion uh, days uh, in Quebec, we do that. Uh, and so we work uh, in uh, collaboration with uh, Quebec authorities for uh, these initiatives, for these uh, open days. And so mm, during the COVID period, it was online um, activities and now it's also in presence. We had more than 100 uh, companies working with us in collaboration with ATCT. So talking about uh, partnerships and prospects, I think I have answered your question, haven't I? Yes, you did. It's a very rich experience and it gives us an idea of the scope of your uh, work. I have two questions for you. So how is the offer of the agency and how is this evolved in, uh, in terms of context and based on the context? And what do you mean by a fair recruitment? So in terms of fair recruitment, in fact, the activity of the agency uh, contains a, a partnership, a fair recruitment, uh, engagement and transparency. These are the principles and fair recruitment is one of the principles of the agency. And so uh, this agency is guarantor for the employer as well as for the candidates work. So in order to ensure fair recruitment throughout the process, and uh, so before, during, uh, and after, after departure and return. So during all phases, we have made sure uh, there is this fair recruitment principle applied. And the digital services have been improved in 2019 with the launch of a new portal that proposes services online. So what does uh, the offer of the agency propose? For employers, there is support offer, so coaching throughout. It is. It starts with a hotel reservation, uh, messages sent to two candidates for their interviews via SMS, um, making available uh, facilities and logistics and human resources necessary, and also supporting employers in uh, strategies at uh, specialized services and complementary training for candidates. And online, a space is offered for employers to uh, post to their offices to access uh, to the uh, roster for the selection of candidates. 
And once the employer have created their own space, there is a process of validation of the employer and the offer. So it is ATCT validating whether the employer is uh, uh, reliable and whether the offer, job offer offers uh, fair recruitment conditions. So there is a previous negotiation and uh, the study of the offer. Once this has been validating, a uh, diffusion is made uh, of the vacancy on the website. And we also ensure the verification of diplomas of candidates in order to ensure uh, a good recruitment process. As of candidates, the offers uh, to them is of a personal space, enabling them to register online, creating a CV online in three languages, so English, French, uh, Arabic. So there are three uh, there are possibilities for the candidates. So we also offer online the possibility to consult the offer on the site and follow one's candidature throughout the process. Candidates might be invited to pass an interview. So after that, we assist them to the preparation of CVs and to get ready for the job interview, but also to obtain information. So at large, uh, this is what uh, uh, our agency carries out. Thank you very much. You have well answered to this question. So I turn into participants to know whether there are specific questions to be addressed to you, to Ms. Garvey, and maybe we have the chance to take further questions at the end. Thank you very much. Uh, for your uh, explanation, it's been very pertinent. And this has enriched our conversation. Thank you very much. I'd like to, to give it a shot with John to make sure if the audio is okay, so we could have like maybe a clear voice there, John. Uh, let me give it a shot because what we did with John, we had the first question was more about the challenges at the European level with all of the complexity in terms of languages, the culture, all of the admin process that are extremely complicated. And it gave us a very convincing answer of how the organization was needed at the European level and how they have been operating. But I would like to move to the next question here, John. Uh, your organization, the European Employment Services Network, um, has multiple impacts. Uh, you have a portal that you could find like nearly 4 million jobs. You have 1 million CV with 5,000 employers registered. That's a powerful tool across the continent. The organization that are members in the employment, uh, the European Employment Service Network have nearly 1,000 trained mobility experts helping workers and employers. Here's the, the question. How does it support the principle of fair labor mobility? We'd like to hear from you, John. You have the floor. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I uh, apologize uh, for the... Uh, uh, low audio uh, quality. I think there's something wrong with the uh, headset, but disregard that. Um, we have a few ways that uh, uh, we uh, support the, the, the principle of fair uh, labor mobility. And, and if you look at it from an overview perspective, we have uh, uh, the information strand, the transparency strand, and the services strand. Uh, recently, we also started with the support strand, which is more on the financial side, uh, financed by the European Commission. But looking at the, the ones that we can do in the member states, uh, the information one, uh, it's about labor market information. We have uh, um, on where are the shortages and where are the surpluses. Uh, we also provide for every country submits for, for publication, including on the Euros portal that you mentioned, the living and working conditions. On, in each member state. Um, that includes also the rights and obligations that uh, you have as a, as a worker or as an employer. So uh, that's the information strand. This is naturally also provided to some extent by the uh, human network of, of colleagues. Uh, however, um, the developments on, on how to access information has meant that it's the provision of information is mostly on the, the website. Uh, we also look very much at transparency. And uh, uh, on the labor market. This is about the available jobs and, and CVs uh, of candidates that you were talking about. And the since the start of the network, we, we were providing the, the uh, demand side 
uh, we show the transparency on the demand side with the jobs per vacancies. But since the reform that we did in 2016, we are now also sending from the member states the CVs of people who have uh, consented to having their data transferred to the portal, which means that we can now provide a more balanced uh, view, which is beneficial both for the candidates that want to find work, but also employees that look for them. So we have created an arena for that. The services that we do there uh, to workers looking for work in another member state and employees looking for talent in, in other member states. And I mentioned the reform, and I think this is something I would like to touch upon because the growth in CVs in particular uh, comes from this reform. And in the mid 2000s, there was an increased need to make adjustments to euros. Uh, we had identified that there were challenge, uh, changes to the labor markets, the additional ways to apply for jobs and candidates. Um, the role of the public employment services had changed, and there were an expansion of private intermediaries, and there were involvement of technical opportunities. And the share of job vacancies that the public employment services had access to was diminishing. Um, so we needed to if we wanted to be transparent about opportunities there were, uh, we needed to remove uh, the obstacle, uh, the boundaries of, uh, we can stay. Thank you. Um, they, we needed to change. Uh, we cannot only rely on the public employment services anymore. We needed to, uh, to get the private involved. Um, there was also a shift from information to support and matching because uh, job seeking has become more complicated procedures. Uh, this led to a broadening of the network where we included private, public, and non profit organizations that work with labor market intermediation. Uh, they, what they provide is a complementarity of services. Uh, they can cooperate to follow the job seekers through their uh, journey. And Euris is here the mark of quality, and we want it to remain that. So, to be recognized as a trustworthy network, we need to. Uh, we need to, uh, those that we help need to understand and commit to the principles that I mentioned before about fair and voluntary mobility. Um, our uh, job seekers need to understand what their rights are, and the employers need to understand that if we were to help them, they need to abide by the, the rules that we have set. They have to follow the national rules. And there was, a, the, um, when we broadened the network, we, we understood that when there are private organizations, there are non-profit organizations and other public organizations coming into an existing network, we needed to instill on them that the fundamental principles of EURES is to be followed and they need to understand them. And the, the, we want to have a culture of ensuring that both workers and employers understand these rights and that they are followed. Um, so in Sweden, to give you an example, we have 15 members and partners. Uh, one of them is the public employment service. The 14 others are, are from different strands. Uh, they have joined the network for many reasons, for access to information, training opportunities, uh, new business opportunities, and to some extent, the commitment to the idea of Europe. They want to be part of the European labor market. But what they all have in common is an understanding that they are joining an existing network and they are willing to commit to the principles to belong to that network. And, and uh, that means that um, they are also on board with the idea that fair mobility comes um, from helping uh, both individuals and organizations to know and follow the rules. So we like to say that you should know your rights and you should know your obligations, and that's something that we can help you with in addition to finding people work. Thank you, John. Uh, thank you for the richness of your presentation and also telling us at the European level, what are the different, not only the challenges, but what are the different uh, actions, what are the different activities and how you're able to mobilize a thousand train mobility mobility experts in order to achieve your the mandate of your organization is quite impressive what you're able to accomplish in your institutions. Um, as a transition here, maybe from like this European uh, presentation, we're going to take a bit more kind of a world uh, angle here. And we have our last speaker for this uh, webinar today. And we're delighted to have Nicole Klob, 
Uh, she's from Germany, and, and she works for the World Association of Public Employment Services. So, Nicole, once again, thank you for being here. We're delighted that you are using your precious time to, to share with us your expertise. As you know, I have two questions. You will have around like kind of 12 minutes. I'll start with the first question to you. Uh, can you tell us more about the World Association of Public Employment Services? Because maybe it is known, maybe there's maybe participants that are curious to know what are your activities and mandate. And we would also would like to know how does this association help your members? So Nicole, over to you. Well, thank you so much, Charles. And thank you to all the panelists of the former ones that were speaking already. So it was really quite interesting uh, to learn about your perspectives and um, about the different approaches. And um, yes, of course, I'm here today on behalf of the WAPES, which stands for World Association of Public Employment Services. Um, our small association was founded in 1988 by six countries, Canada, France, Germany, the Netherlands, Sweden, and the USA, with the help of their international labor organization, actually. And um, since 2012, WAPES is an international nonprofit association under Belgian law. Our headquarters are based in Brussels, not in Germany, I'm sorry, but we are actually um, located directly in Brussels in the middle, middle of the center, actually. So um, right now we have eight staff members, which are mainly um, um, put together through second men from different public employment services. I myself uh, from Germany, seconded by the German Federal Employment Agency. Then I have a colleague from France, from Pôle Emploi, um, the French speak of the French uh, public employment services, and also a uh, colleague uh, from Japan. She is also seconded from the Japanese Ministry, and also some other colleagues that are also contracted under Belgian law. So um, this makes already a broad variety um, itself uh, within itself. So of uh, different cultures and everything. So um, yes. Um, and just to, to talk a little bit more about our members, we, we have currently 76 public employment services from all around the world um, in five different regions, which is the Asia Pacific, Europe, Africa, the MIAC, which stands for Middle East and Arabic countries, and the Americas as well. So we operate in three languages, which are French, Spanish, and English. Um, so, um, like I said, it's, a, it's already the setup is already very diverse. Yes, and um, um, what do we like? What is the mandate? So um, as an international organization, we bring together public employment services from all around the world. And our primary mandate is to promote cooperation, exchange of knowledge and best practices, of course, amongst, amongst our members. So we also serve as a platform for collaboration and networking amongst also the public employment services which are government agencies and it really depends on the setup of the country, on the legal framework and everything. Um, uh, we, we provide different services um, like bench learning under the members, um, uh, which can include job matching, career counseling, training programs, unemployment benefits administration, and support for workforce development initiatives. So, what are we actually doing the whole day or what am I doing? Um, provide helpful advice and support public employment services in different countries. Also work very closely with the agencies um, and also with the people um, that try to solve the problems or have challenges or successes and share these stories. Um, we do research, we analyze policies and create practical solutions, um, make employment services better and hopefully more efficient. Um, we also help design and run trainings, uh, training programs and workshops to help people who work within the agencies um, to, to apply this more to their agencies. And um, we talk to other um, importance uh, about these services, share good ways of doing things and help connect the people. That's the, that's the main purpose, actually, the networking. So how do we really um, precisely 
um, um, help our members. So what's the what's the concrete terms? Um, we do have peer learning and exchanges. So we organize study visits, workshops and conferences where member organizations have the opportunity to learn from each other, like I said. So this is pretty much like a bench learning approach and it involves studying and adopting successful approaches from other public employment service. Namely, we call it the SAMPES, which stands for Strategic Mission on Public Employment Services in the context of, in the context of WAVES. So we do have um, counselors that are trained on this program. Right now, we're, we, we, um, we, um, we are in the establishing back the program. So we had already somebody that was training this program. Um, so we have somebody coming and like and doing the job next time very soon. Um, so uh, it will apply to different public employment services. So um, taking the approach from maybe something that was really successful and share it with a public employment service and try to implement it into, into their services as well. So that's the way of learning from each other. And also we have online knowledge sharing platforms. We maintain online platforms such as discussion forums and knowledge repositories where member organizations can share resources, research findings and case studies. Um, we also do have coming up also only dedicated to our members um, series of past briefings where public employment services will showcase their approaches and will show what has been successful, what they try to deal with, what are the challenges. And you can discover that it's uh, actually on the whole planet somehow the same, but on a different level which is quite interesting. And yeah, we really try to connect the members on that one as well so that they can share and maybe find together very good solutions, which is very often the case actually. Yes, and um, yes, of course, also we support um, capacity building uh, programs. Um, actually, um, WAPES offers capacity buildings uh, tailored to the needs of the member organizations. Um, actually, we have a, something coming up in the near future. We're also in collaboration with the International Labor Organization concerning Convention 88, um, which is a convention implemented by many countries, um, but some of our members did not implement it. So we're really working also on that one together to ensure fair, fair recruitment processes, since we're also... Um, um, like, like I said, um, the, this is a, an approach that really, really um, goes into also spreading the word of fair recruitment and we're also trying to spread the word on that one as well. And uh, like I said, we do a lot of research and policy development. We have a G7 working group right now that is working on greening of the labor market. So this is something that is really right now going on. So we have um, something that we're establishing right now, um, um, a catalog for actions. So that will also um, display good examples. And it will be also something that will be given out to other members later on. And we'll work with other members on that one as well. And it's a big topic that actually um, is, is, is something that is uh, applies to many, many countries. And of course, um, the world stops, the world doesn't like this, like a country doesn't stop at the border. So um, it's something that is, uh, the whole world is actually concerned with. So um, we're really working on that one in order to serve our members even better on that one. Um, like I said, also, we do like a lot of networking events. Um, we organize uh, networking events such as annual conferences, regional meetings, where member organizations can connect, network, and engage in discussions. So we're organizing right now um, an event on the topic of needs, which stands for uh, young people neither in, employ neither in employment nor training or education. So um, we are um, organizing an event on that one in the near future in November coming up for our members, where we'll share knowledge as well and uh, talk about different concepts um, on that one as well. All I'm right. hoping it, I answered your question. <laughs> you you did, you question. did, you did. That's quite a long <laughs> list of activities. And thank you for sharing. I think it's a very yes, comprehensive portfolio of, like, uh, of activities you're offering your members. I would like to narrow it down to uh, fair recruitment practices. And so I think it would be useful for all of us to, if you could give us more example, concrete example from your members with regards uh, to fair recruitment practices and how you engage uh, across your different activities. Over to you. 
Yes, thank you so much. Yes, I've been preparing a little bit for this and I've been talking uh, to our members as well. So um, um, it might be very interesting to the countries today here that are in the audience. And so um, uh, we've been, I've been interviewing South Korea, North Macedonia and the US on that. Um, there are different approaches um, that they apply. So I found it really interesting. I learned so much by myself as well. So um, South Korea is using the 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 so-called blind recruitment approach, um, also known as the anonymous or name blind recruitment. It's used in South Korea to promote fairness and reduce biases in hiring. It fo focuses on applicants' qualifications and abilities rather than personal characteristics. So the measures include removing personal information. So employers anonymize job applications by removing names, gender, age, and photos during the initial screening. Um, to ensure that uh, information is solely based on qualifications and experience, which I found very interesting. Um, they also use uh, blind evaluation systems. Some companies implement blind evaluation systems where recruiters review, review qualifications without personal information. Uh, this reduces also unconscious biases in the selection process. And also there are implemented standardized tests. Um, they help to assess job related competencies like problem solving and critical thinking to ensure fairness. Um, the key milestones in South Korea are actually that in 2017, the public bodies banned asking candidates for personal details like schools, names, birthplace and physical attributes. Photos on application forms were also prohibited which I found also very interesting. Um, 2019, the blind, blind hiring bill expanded to companies with 30 or more employees, uh, prohibiting rele irrelevant personal information requests and recruitment irregularities. Violations incur penalties as well. So this is really like a bill. So um, this is really interesting and also this implementation represents one of the tools that South Korea approach uses to align with the ILO fair, fair recruitment strategy. So this is just one an example of South Korea, which I found to be really interesting. And um, I have another example, like I said, from North Macedonia. Um, they um, do have a lot um, of the Roma community in North Macedonia. And it's a significant minority group facing social and economic challenges. So there have been efforts made to promote their inclusion and address their needs. A government organizes and focus on improving living conditions, education, healthcare, and employment opportunities for the Roma. Social inclusion programs combat discrimination, stereotypes, and ensure equal access to rights and services. The Roma participation and decision making and representation in public institutions are being enhanced. So and they do have um, uh, a center in Skopje as the, uh, this is the capital city and plays a crucial role in promoting Roma inclusion into the labor market. Um, the local center has been established to support unemployed Roma and other vulnerable groups as well. So they have to, do have special mentors that motivate and inform them about employment opportunities, improving their professional capacities, and also they apply individuals approaches to identify skills and qualification. So um, in this model, uh, especially uh, within North Macedonia aligns with the International Labor Organization for the fair recruitment principles by including Roma individuals in the, fair, in, in the labor market, ensuring equal access and combating ethnicity-based discrimination. Another very well, um, interesting example I think so um, and also um, I've been talking to uh, to the U.S. as well they prioritize fair recruitment practices aligned with international labor standards as well uh, promote inclusive and equitable approaches upholding non-discrimination including freedom of association collective bargaining are safeguarded the USA actively combats forced labor, human trafficking, and labor exploitation, ensuring ethical recruitment practices that respect workers' rights and dignity. So on a national level, the main observer for this is the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission that takes care that um, these, uh, these obligations are also, um, uh, also observed and aligned with everything. So, um, the USA believe its measures align also with the ILO fair, 
fair recruitment principles, fostering an inclusive and equitable employment environment that promotes non-discrimination, equal opportunity, transparency, and workers' rights protection. So um, these are just a few examples I have um, collected from our members, of course, and I see in the chat, there is also a question about that. Of course, there's like multiple examples on that one, but like in the short speaking period, I can only cover three examples for now. So um, if you want to get back with me, so don't hesitate. We're open to that. Thank you. Así que no duden en avisarme. Muchas gracias, Nicole. Este es el momento en el webinario donde vamos a esperar más preguntas de nuestra audiencia. Nuevamente, repito, por favor, utilicen en el Zoom el espacio de preguntas y respuestas. Hay diferentes tipos de puntos que quiere enfatizar en este prog programa. Si ustedes ven, hemos identificado. Sorry, Charles, one second. We can hear Spanish in the English channel. Please, interpreters, fix. All right. Thank you, uh, Isham, making sure that also the interpretation channel are working properly. Donc, c'est sans doute un bon moment pour moi, peut-être, d'opérer la, la transition entre l'anglais et le français. So, that's a good moment to go back to French. And so, yes, this is the Q&A uh, time. And uh, let me invite you to use the function Q&A that you find in uh, our uh, Zoom uh, interface. And, you, and we will select one question for each uh, panelist. And we actually already received one. Uh, Maxime Ake is the author of this question. And Ma'am Barry, uh, you are the one uh, uh, who was mentioned by uh, Maxime Ake. My name is Maxime uh, Ake, and I work at the CEEAC, uh, Central Africa. We're talking about free circulation and recognition of skills and prior learning. They are both challenges for us. And the coherence in our region is another very big uh, challenge. We already uh, followed some ILO uh, trainings in, on, on this matter, but we would like to have, Mam Barry, your perspective, and we would like to know what do you think that we need to do in order to enhance the situation in our region, sub-region. I think that this is a very uh, relevant question. Re recognition of skills. When we started, uh, Mam Barry, can you? Can you please open the camera? Thank you. Can you see me now? When we started uh, our one service for the non-graduates, one of the main challenges we found was exactly what uh, the participant mentioned. When you don't have a diploma, how can you give value to their competences and, and, and skills on the resume and CV. So how can you recognize their experience and their, their skills? This is very important um, for their profile uh, to be attractive. Uh, and that was for the our citizens. When you talk about uh, and of migrants, you have uh, other additional challenges uh, concerning the recognition, even of uh, qualifications um, and, and diplomas. We worked with GIZ, GIZ and other uh, representatives from the different sectors, for instance, hairdressing and other sectors with whom we worked in order to give migrants a title, a kind of certification of their actual skills. It would be interesting to have an official document that can be uh, recognized everywhere and where uh, skills can be certified and this uh, title or this certificate can be used uh, for these migrants uh, to, to go on with their uh, training and or for some specific professions you need obviously a certification and that's why we worked with uh, vocational training department and we actually have an act 
um, nowadays, but we're still waiting for the final adoption uh, steps. But I think, and I am convinced that this work uh, must be uh, done in uh, collaboration with all uh, decision makers, the government in particular, but also vocational uh, training department, the enterprises and the private sector and also public sector, but also it, with the involvement of the, the, the people uh, who are the actual beneficiaries. beneficiaries. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Barry. Thank you for giving us this extra and additional information, um, which are very interesting uh, to us and in the sake of our um, webinar. Let's go to Ma'am Kensha Garbi, and the question is by Ma'am Dilara. We're talking about strategic level here, and Ma'am Ruzulava uh, asks, what are the follow-up strategies for people who are placed at uh, the level of of the employers at the, in the different enterprises. So what do you do as an association to give a follow-up to, the, to, the, to, those, to those people who were placed? Well, for people working in public uh, sector, we have a detachment mechanism that was established by the Tunisian government um, for people working in the public sector abroad. And the employer, em employee, uh, has a follow-up system uh, he can benefit from. So that's an administrative follow-up uh, during the experience. And when the contract ends, when they come back, they can also uh, go back to the, their position. So where they were working in Tunisia, in the public sector before moving, uh, before, working, before working abroad. And so this is also a very important uh, administrative mechanism and, and system uh, that is important for uh, pensions, especially in countries where you don't have an actual uh, social protection coverage uh, it's for old age pensions. So this mechanism uh, allows them to have their benefits in the end. And the rights. And then we have another one uh, for employees in the public and uh, private uh, sector. So employees that uh, we uh, placed in uh, abroad uh, ha can benefit from this follow-up mechanism uh, that uh, can also carry out some visits uh, or send uh, some questionnaires or surveys to the employer in order to uh, to verify the situation or the employee. The employee can also send uh, direct uh, messages to this uh, uh, office or uh, go to our regional office at the embassy, in the embassies. Uh, thank you for giving us this, this information. Uh, this is a very a good example of mechanisms that can actually guarantee and, and ensure uh, the protection of these uh, workers. I'm going to try once again with John. Hopefully the audio is working slightly better uh, once again this time. So John, we have a question here about the targeted mobility scheme that you have within your organization. So the question is the following. Can you please tell us more about the, this targeted mobility scheme and what support scheme provides to both job seekers and employers? Over to you, John. You might need to unmute yourself, John. There we uh, go. Thank you. Yes, I got the unmute the prompt here. Um, thank you. It's a good question. As I, as I mentioned earlier, um, you started with the uh, in, information uh, provision and uh, uh, transparency. They moved on to be more about services uh, linked to matching of job seekers and employers. And for about 10 years now, uh, the European Commission has uh, provided finances for uh, the target EURES targeted mobility schemes, uh, which is a way of combining the services that our colleagues, the EURES advisors, provide to job seekers and employers uh, with financial support. Uh, this financial support is designed to 
uh, lower uh, some obstacles uh, related to, to initial costs uh, for traveling uh, or relocating to another country. Uh, so there are um, interview support if you want to go to uh, another country for interviews. Uh, since the pandemic, uh, this has uh, reduced. Uh, we do more of the interviews online these days. Uh, but there is also uh, relocation that uh, you can get support when you relocate, uh, paying for the airfare or, or train tickets, etc. Uh, there is also support for uh, taking language classes. As I mentioned, uh, and you hopefully heard it in my first intervention, the, the number one identified obstacles for Europeans wanting to move to another country is language skills. So this is an opportunity to provide uh, the financial resources to do a training in, in the language of the country where you are moving, even before you move. There is also support for recognitions of, of uh, uh, your uh, diplomas or credentials. Uh, so that, and there are extra su su uh, supplemental support for people with special needs. Uh, there is also a family allowance. So if you're not moving alone, you're moving with a, a partner of, of one kind or another and children, uh, there can be some extra money because the traveling cost for relocation is higher. Uh, then for employers, we can also provide a, uh, uh, some su financial support for the introduction of a new employee into the workplace. Uh, there could be extra costs associated with that. Uh, every uh, onboarding uh, is associated with costs, but in particular, if you're recruiting someone from another country. So that's a way of uh, alleviating some of that um, investment that an employer should make into a new employee to make sure that the uh, employment becomes a sustainable one. And this is a great... Uh, complement to the services that our colleagues uh, provide throughout Europe. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much for your for your answer on this very interesting uh, targeted mobility scheme. That's probably an example that need to be looked at more carefully and maybe it could be reproduced also in different countries. Um, I see here uh, there, there was also a question that I could see also for Nicole here. So I will I'll be delighted to have her back here in, in the spotlight. Uh, the question is about this World uh, Association of Public Employment Services, uh, which obviously dedicated to uh, public employment services. But can you tell us more about the role of your members and their initiative in an evolving recruitment um, environment? The external parameters are changing and would like to know to what extent your members are taking, I would say, promising and, let's say, innovative uh, initiative. Over to you, Nicole. Yes, of course. Um, um, uh, like I said, we have a very crucial role in uh, for also when it comes to evolving the recruitment landscape. Um, so we do not only address current challenges, but also anticipate future trends or like also the current ones are very important, but we need to observe a little bit more into the future, what will be coming up and everything like that. So that is uh, one of also one of our main tasks. So um, right now, um, many countries are facing demographic changes. That's one of our big topics right now that we, we discover that uh, is something that um, actually applies to many countries as well. So um, we are um, addressing this proactive with the aging workforce and changing population dynamics, we focus on upskilling and reskilling programs to ensure individuals can adapt to evolving job requirements. Also, um, one of the big topics right now is the decarbonization. And like I've mentioned before already, we do have the G7 working group right now that is uh, starting like a pilot, big pilot project on that one um, where we will implement it later onto other countries and other member countries. Um, we really recognize the importance of the sustainable employment and the green economy on that one. Um, another big thing is uh, the developing of social economy. Our members actively support the social economy, which encompasses organizations driven by social and environmental objectives. 
So um, another big topic, and we've heard that um, quite often today is migration. Like there's a lot of outgoing, incoming. So really made me to make sure um, in the light of fair recruitment that we can serve these people, get them ready when they want to, you know, move to another country or if they are incoming, get them ready with language skills. Like as we heard before already from Euros um, that they offer language courses, that kind of stuff. Um, it's something that we um, public employment services actively collaborate with employers to promote diversity and tap into the skills and talents that migrants bring, contributing also to economic growth and social cohesion. So um, these are like the main topics, of course, there's much more to discover, but um, these are just the main topics that we're working on right now. And um, these are also things that will also um, we will um, have to discuss more in the future as well, I guess. So, so I hope Thank I you. answered your question. <laughs> no, absolutely. Thank you very much, Nicole. That's also in terms of like time management, we're also getting closer to the end of it where we had an opportunity to have one question per speaker. Uh, we were also, we had the opportunity to listen to them on two crucial questions. I mean, the first one was a lot about the services of their uh, public employment services. And the second one, to what extent they are engaging in fair recruitment. I think they gave a, a very convincing case that more can be done, more is being done, and there's a lot of initiative that are taking place. So this role of webinars, knowledge sharing, getting the information across the different countries is really at the core of this uh, webinar. And we're grateful to all of our uh, panelists, not only to take time away of away from their important responsibility, but to be able to convey, I mean, the importance of those acti activities and how they're making a difference in different countries around the world. So thank you to all of our panelists. So before uh, that we close the seminar, I would like to invite our ILO colleagues, uh, um, Madame Gayla Rodi Freezer. She's the chief technical advisor of a project called Integrated Program on Fair Recruitment at the Fundamental Department in the ILO Geneva. And she's a great colleague and very active at the ILO for many years. Uh, and she is the project manager at the International Labor Office in Geneva. And she is dedicated to a program for the implementation of a fair recruitment initiative around the world. So we're really talking about the person that is putting all of the pieces of the puzzle together, sharing information, making sure this international wisdom is being shared across the world. Before this uh, initiative or this project, she was previously working as the global technical lead on livelihoods and economic inclusion with the UN Refugees Agency and a crisis recovery specialist with UNDP. She has a background in environmental sciences and has worked across Africa, Asia on environmental and livelihood programming with a focus on crisis response and recovery. And she will, on behalf of the ILO, uh, share some concluding remark and also uh, give us some more instruction, information as maybe follow-up activities. So, uh, Gaila, over to you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Charles, and uh, and thanks to our speakers and to the participants for the great questions and the very lively uh, exchange also on the chat. So the number of participants on this event, uh, I think, reflects a great deal of interest on the role of public employment services. There's many examples across regions where uh, the public employment services are driving good practice and realizing fair recruitment, and through this, critically increasing the labor market efficiency and protecting workers' rights. Uh, also, I wanted to mention a couple of regions with also promising developments. Um, in Latin America, the PES have been taking steps to strengthen their services to both national and migrant workers and to share information across country. Uh, so in particular, the services of Colombia and Ecuador are engaged on a pilot project supported by the ILO where both services exchange information on vacancies and job seekers. So this allows, for instance, a civil engineer from Venezuela arriving in Colombia to access job information, um, job opportunities, not only in Colombia, but also in Ecuador. And a key part of this pilot is, is of course, the understanding and the adoption of fair recruitment principles by employment services. Um, other countries, such as Peru, has expressed interest in joining that. So uh, hopefully a trend there towards really regional level sharing of information 
Um, in these examples, and, and as well as in Morocco, uh, with, with the excellent example there, the services are really driving socioeconomic integration by helping to meet the needs in the labor market and guiding the job search more effectively for migrants in host countries, but also for, for other job seekers who would normally fall outside of, of the labor market. So it's really a pro proactive uh, systems that are put in place. Um, and the development of regional networks, it's a, it's a very promising development, but it's also a complex journey, uh, as it was explained also by Jon today with the ex example of, of Eurus. Um, regions, some regions have the advantage of a common language, but um, on the other hand, there's also many challenges with sometimes the lack of a harmonized legal framework for the mobility of workers, um, sometimes the lack of a governance framework that centralizes information. So complex challenges, but at the same time, and also this applies, I think, to across sub-regions in Africa. I saw somebody mentioning this in the chat, um, that there, there's also the growth of the regional, uh, regional economic communities in some regions that it's a start really also to provide crucial platform to stimulate dialogue and policies to promote the free movement of persons across countries. A few examples also from the Arab states. Um, there is a limited engagement of public employment services in, in recruitment of migrant workers, but with some exceptions, uh, Saudi Arabia launched an online digital platform called Musaned, uh, which is dedicated to uh, domestic workers. Um, it's uh, it's really there to address some of the recruitment issues, such as illegal charging of fees and contract substitution. And right now, it's the only means of recruitment of domestic workers in the country. So it's it has helped to promote transparency in the process. Um, digitalization also of employment services has accelerated, of course, during COVID-19 pandemic, uh, which created a context where some employees had to let go of workers. Well, Others who are dependent on international labor were struggling to meet labor needs because of border closures. And in this context, also in the Arab states, several countries, Bahrain, uh, United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, had introduced to job mobility web platforms to provide job matching between employers and migrant workers who were already in country and who just up were, were terminated. So these digital platform post-COVID some of them have continued to evolve um, and really are have a role in assisting the in internal labor mobility and providing an alternative to international uh, recruitment. Um, so I think what, one of the things in terms of the takeaway from this session uh, that has been a, a constant, um, uh, re I think, remark from, from the presentations is how the public employment services are really responding to constant change. Uh, we started off with Anna Karin, our keynote speaker, uh, who had us thinking about the importance of, of the public employment services in maintaining that resilience and an intermediation and facilitation service uh, throughout the changing world, uh, which has really been rocked by mega trends, demographic changes, climate change, the need to adopt sustainable and inclusive economic models. So this notion of constant adaptation to the changing environment really came through. Morocco adopting this new line of services for vulnerable workers, the proactive reach out to enterprises, uh, the URS network that supports fair mobility and mapping shortages, but also gaining new members and new profiles in their membership um, of people who really want information and business opportunities um, and to be part of this information sharing and this, this trend of centralized information sharing. Uh, Tunisia experience as well, I think is a really good, very good reflection of how public employment service can be really uh, switched on to uh, the understanding the trends in the international labor market and constantly adapting their their offer of services in relation to to the supply of jobs the demand for jobs um, on the international level um i think also the the, the really uh, informative uh, presentation on waves uh, that provides really a needs-based response and support to member organization very much switched on to 
uh, understanding what the trends are. Um, some very good examples there as well of practices that promote non-discrimination. Uh, this is really a, a very also interesting trend and it seems to be very prominent um, in some of the new practices um, in, in the public employment services. So um, before closing this event, because I see the time is running and many people are, are logging off. So thank you again to the speakers, to Naima, Jorn, Kanza and Nicole. Uh, thank you, of course, to our excellent interpreters, um, our moderator, Charles uh, and the ILO ITC team that have prepared the event. Um, so for some, for also some of the questions there, the event is recorded in the three languages and will be available on the Knowledge Hub. So it is one of a new thematic series of webinars offered by the ILO through the Fair Recruitment Initiative Knowledge Hub. You have the link there in the chat for that. Please register to that so you can keep getting the information. We will have another session after the summer um, we have, uh, an, we will have also another event concerning employment services, possibly on the, the link and the collaboration between public and private services. There'll also be an event on access to remedy and justice in the case of recruitment abuses and another event on the indicators of unfair recruitment practices. So now it's time to thank you very much to all for your participation and wish you uh, a good day. Thanks very much. Mm -hmm.